All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our special ed leaders meeting. Uh, we know that we continue to just stay strong together. And uh, you've been through so much in this past year. I know that we're all excited for, you know, maybe the school year to wind down soon and to look ahead to summer. Uh, but these weeks are, are precious. Our time with students is precious. So um, just finding that confidence to get through to the end, to make it meaningful for yourself, for your staff, for your parents, for your students. Um, we're better together coming together here today, and I know that you're better together with your teams every day that you are leading them, guiding them, supporting them. Um, I see the great work you're doing, and I so appreciate it. So just keep it up. Um, find that hope. Find that strength. Share that hope. Share that strength to get us all to uh, the end of this school year successfully, proudly, and uh, look forward to what comes next for all of us. Here's what we're doing today. Uh, we've got our usual kind of way that we uh, structure these discussions together. There's a wide variety of topics that we're covering today. Uh, and so hold on, we'll take some deep breaths as we go from topic to topic, just to make sure that you are, you know, kind of absorbing, hearing what we are talking about today. Feel free to ask questions, but here's what's important about the Q&A for today. Uh, we don't, we're, we're experimenting with not having the Q&A wide open. Um, instead, directing your questions, I would ask that you direct your questions to April, who is the host. Um, Zoom enables you to ask any of the host or co-host questions, and, and you can do that. Um, please do not ask me questions, though, because I will not see them in the chat. Uh, my other, my host, our host, April, and our co-hosts will see the questions. Uh, the easiest if you just totally uh, send them mainly towards April. Uh, but uh, we will make sure that we get to as many of your questions as we can, particularly because I know we're covering a wide variety of topics today, and I will keep leaning in. You know, give me the high sign if I'm ever uh, if I'm ever fading out again, uh, because I tend to like lean back a little bit. But let's go over some things that we've talked about in the past. I just want to start by thanking the early adopter cohort uh, schools and districts. So, as you recall, our IEP improvement project has three critical components. There's updating the IEP itself and the work that we're doing around everything from eligibility, referral, identification, uh, the IEP form itself, um, and support materials for parents. Uh, there's the stakeholder engagement around all of that. And then really importantly, we have our early adopter cohort uh, that are helping to lead the way in um, a, you know, the change that we're wanting to instill in special education, the way in which we want to bring general education teachers and special education teachers together in new ways to support our students with disabilities even better than we have in the past. So these, are, again, uh, are our early adopter uh, cohort schools and districts. And we just want to thank them as we as we begin to wind down the school year as well. Uh, they've come together as a team done a lot of work around self-assessment, analyzing data and setting goals. And they've just showed amazing commitment to learning new practices because that's what being an early adopter is all about. Um, kind of being willing to change, being willing to think and grow, but it's really coming from within. It's, you know, they're helping to solve um, the challenges that they're facing right from within their own schools. No one is coming and telling them what to do. Uh, they are figuring out these new practices and understanding, are they are you getting traction? Are the new practices leading to better results? Can we measure outcomes and see uh, change for students and really just engaging in a lot more and different professional learning experiences together? And you know, that's hard to do in the middle of a pandemic. So just wanna say thank you to them. And we can't wait to the way that we can all learn from you uh, to better support our students all across the state. So, uh, just moving on, like I said, we have a, a variety of topics today, so we're going to go to dyslexia next. Um, many of you have asked us questions. This is really trying to be responsive to what we've heard from you in our previous meetings about under which disability category should you identify a specific learning disability. And so uh, the point of this brief part of the conversation today is to talk about where do the um, thinking about the uh, eligibility definitions. Um, and how it relates to dyslexia. And we really wanna focus on um, the, the um, definitions that uh, focus on this kind of neurobiological basis like dyslexia. So uh, keep in mind that, you know, we've got the general definitions for each disability category, as well as the criteria to go with it. Uh, we're all, I think, very familiar with that, the 13 disability categories. We know that Massachusetts is a little bit different than uh, the, the federal criteria. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. 
Um, and I think it's always important to remind ourselves that uh, the work in identifying a student's disability type is really on the team. And while certainly we appreciate the information that could come from a medical evaluation and can be considered by the team, should be considered by the team, um, it's really the general agreement among the team members about uh, what we are learning from the assessment data in order to determine which definition is the right match for that student. And so with that in mind, again, we're, we're used to that process, we're familiar with that process, but just remember from the Dear Colleague letter that came out uh, several years ago that we can name dyslexia as part of the um, IEP process. There's nothing holding us back. Um, and so we'll consider those medical diagnoses when they come in, use them as part of the evaluation process. Um, but you know, we don't uh, have to solely make an evaluation determination uh, based on a medical diagnosis. We put all of the evaluation data together. Um, and I know you're familiar with that process. Uh, and so let's, um, let's just keep moving on into talking about what does that mean for dyslexia? Where do we best identify dyslexia within the 13 disability categories? Uh, so as always, though, we want to just make sure that we provide those supports and interventions, regardless of what the disability category is. Uh, we are you know, non-categorical in Massachusetts that students can get any type of service uh, that is related to their unique needs. You don't have to be in a certain category in order to get the services you need. Um, but getting the category right certainly you know, sets the right uh, tone, sets the right um, focus for the team as well. And so let's just take a look at how we think about that for um, dyslexia. So I think pretty um, plain and simple. I, I like the way that my team described this here that dyslexia is a specific learning disability that it has a neurobiological origin. And uh, again, what we've done for you here is just sort of, you know, show you that side by side comparison of our Massachusetts regulatory language around um, the identification of a specific learning disability uh, as compared to the, uh, the federal regulation, the IDEA regulations. Um, and, you know, for me, when I just read this, what we have in uh, kind of the, the orange print there about a specific learning disability is, um, you know, a disorder of one or more of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding or in using language spoken or written, uh, and that may manifest itself in the ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or do math calculations. You know, for me, that, that just so well encapsulates what dyslexia is is that, you know, it, the way in which it impacts, um, you know, reading, writing, spelling. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that it, the, the match is pretty clear to me here um, under specific learning disability, as opposed to, I think a lot of the question that we got was about neurological. And uh, we just want to be clear that uh, dyslexia should be categorized as a specific learning disability. Um, again, you see that difference between our definition and the federal definition. And, you know, it, I know that sometimes people, you know, look for a reading of this um, definition to include dyslexia. Um, I just think that, you know, obviously there's so much better clarity in my mind around specific learning disability and the language that you see there versus here. So I hope this is helpful. We, we want to be clear about where we think uh, it's best to identify students with dyslexia, and we hope that's helpful to you cool. as you continue to go ahead. I'm going to shift gears now. We're going to go on to what I've heard uh, repeatedly about in terms of the staffing uh, crunch that many of you are under, uh, trying to retain staff for the summer, for next year, hire staff for the summer, for next year. And um, while I don't have you know the uh, a magic bullet for you, I did want to reiterate to you that the emergency licensure provision is extended through next year. And so if you have teachers on emergency licenses, or if you need to hire more teachers on an emergency license, license, you are able to continue to do so. And, you know, I'd love to get your feedback on this, but we are thinking about, um, you know, as we hire teachers on emergency licenses, what additional supports do they need? And could the state help with an induction and mentoring program? So we are um, interested in uh, maybe trying to set something up regionally uh, that could help sort of add to maybe some of the induction and mentoring activities that you have planned. Uh, but if we know that we have more teachers coming in on emergency licenses, perhaps in special education, what are those extra steps that we can do to support them? And I realize that you know, 
these issues are complex and difficult. So I uh, appreciate your willingness just to stay at the, the hiring and the recruitment process. And hopefully our extension of the emergency licensure provision uh, will be one thing just to, to help that as well. So I'm gonna go on now to another topic. Like I said, we're, we're kind of going through a lot of different special ed topics today. And the next one is about um, our uh, guidance around uh, physical restraint requirements and um, if they're used. Um, and we really wanna stress that, like we, we really wanna see a continual reduction and moving towards elimination where possible of physical restraint. And if you recall, those of you who've been around for a while now, it's kind of hard to think that, you know, 2016 is a while ago now, but with a pandemic between then and now, it certainly feels like it. So keeping in mind that, you know, we updated our regulation for physical restraint um, in 2016. Um, the training material that we had for it was really um, kind of built around the shift that came in 2016, but that shift has been made. Uh, it's no longer new, obviously, five years later. And so we felt it was really important that we updated our training material. We call it an RLO, which stands for reusable learning object. Uh, so it's an interactive um, learning tool that you can use with your teams uh, to help share the critical information that they need to know about physical restraint. And so as you're planning, for example, for the start of next school year and the PD that you need to provide, um, that's a requirement around physical restraint, we hope that our updated RLO uh, will be really helpful to you in um, being able to use something almost turnkey, we hope, with your staff uh, to provide them that overview training. It's not the in-depth training for staff who might be um, engaged in physical restraint, but that overview training, I think this could be really helpful. Might not be the only thing that you use. Uh, you can use part of it. You can use all of it, uh, but just hope that it's, uh, that it's useful to you. You can kind of see a screenshot on the right there of what the actual tool looks like. Um, you know, I think it's engaging, you know, it's a lot of good graphics in it and whatnot. Um, what you'll find in it is an even greater emphasis from us on uh, de-escalation strategies, on avoiding restraint, and also a new emphasis on thinking about the traumatic impact of restraint on both staff and students. And so let's not take this lightly. Uh, let's be um, very thoughtful and mindful of uh, restraint um, for the vast majority of our students needs to be um, incredibly rare uh, or non-existent. And uh, if we take the mindset of, you know, uh, holding students physically um, could, you know, have traumatic effects, uh, both for them and for the staff doing it, you know, let, I think it would help us continue to reframe how we use this, this technique in our schools. And so you'll, you'll find that in there, and I hope you'll find this useful. Um, Welcome feedback and comments. It's a living document. Uh, we've updated it once, we'll update it again. Uh, so we hope you find it useful too. Some new information um, as we go ahead and some things that have happened most recently. Uh, so just this week, uh, as you're aware, we released our special education determine, uh, determination letters to you. Uh, keep in mind that every year we are required to provide uh, these, uh, these determinations. So this is not new. Uh, and they do come every year. We had been in uh, discussions about whether or not we um, had to do them this year. And so that's kind of why, you know, part of why it took a little while for them to come out this year. Uh, and so we, but having the clarity that we do need to provide them, which we're, which we're glad for, uh, we were able to uh, provide this to you this week to identify um, you know, which of the uh, uh, categories your district fits into, your school or district fits into, actually districts, LEAs in the state. And, um, you know, we've, we've sent these letters. We just ask that you uh, really take a look at them. Um, and we have developed a new rubric for this year to use. I think we will continue to evolve the rubric as we go ahead. Um, and, but really the rubric that um, we've been able to share with you that I actually have on the next slide. I think really creates more kind of transparency around this process. What went into it? Why did you get this designation? I remember getting the letter when I was a special ed director. Um, and we hope that having a rubric now just brings more um, transparency, more consistency, and, you know, more focus on improvement activities because you, the rubric kind of points to, well, what are the areas around special education that 
um, your district maybe needs to continue to improve in, and where are you already strong? Uh, so, um, you know, the the um, information is um, hopefully out. If you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And you know, um, many of you are already engaged in the type. If you are identified as needs assistance, needs intervention, or needs substantial intervention. Um, in most cases, you're already engaged in those type of, um, particularly for needs and intervention, needs system, substantial intervention, you're already engaged in those types of intervention activities with us. Um, it might be coming from our statewide systems of support team, um, our office for strategic transformation, could be with audit and compliance. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the type of work that you are already doing with DESI actually fits into, um, you know, the, the way in which we are trying to support you with this this type of determination so let's go on to the actual rubric um, here's the rubric that we used for this year uh, like i said you know we we are committed to keeping a rubric um, but we also want to kind of learn from this experience this year and continue to drive ahead with uh, some changes and alterations for next year so you know i know that uh, this will be what we engage with our um, advisory panel around and others to continue to get information and ideas about the use of our rubric for the determinations. And we look forward to uh, hearing your thoughts on it as well. But again, um, this is the first time that I think we're showing a rubric for this. And I think it really helps with that transparency piece too. So another thing that happened this week is that we released an administrative advisory. Uh, and this is 21-2. Uh, really focusing on the financial and programmatic responsibility for uh, special education and enforcement of assignments. So the LA assignment process that we're all very familiar with, you've probably been through it many times around um, asking for LA clarification. And um, uh, so this memo helps to kind of just update on um, changes that have been made uh, and some clarifications of things that, you know, we've all gotten used to that we've sort of codified in writing um, now as sort of an update for all of us. So a few key things uh, to keep in mind. Um, we uh, are continue to be in the practice of sending alerts, which means that, you know, if, if we receive a request for LA assignment, we let all parties know um, any other district that would be affected, potentially affected by the uh, request um, by a new LEA assignment. Uh, we ask for information by sending out alerts and, um, you know, we ask that, uh, you know, after we issue that assignment, what we clarify or, or further describe in this document is that um, you can uh, ask for a review of the assignment if there's new information to present for us or appeal to the BSEA. So that's part of what's included in this advisory. Um, and the um, let's just walk through a little bit about what happens if um, if there's a complaint about the implementation of the LEA assignment. So keep in mind when you get an LEA assignment, as you all know, needs to be implemented without delay um, because we wanna make sure that, you know, students are getting the services and the placements, frankly, that they need. And so uh, let's just walk through what happens if um, a, a party involved in the process uh, sends us a, a complaint saying that the LEA assignment has not been followed through on. Um, so uh, we would um, let you know, first of all, that we received a complaint. Um, and as long as you then assume responsibility and send documentation to us that it's implemented, we take no further action. Um, if you don't assume responsibility, then uh, our problem resolution system team would open a formal complaint and um, we could issue a notice of intent to withhold funds. And so uh, keep in mind that that's where we would say, this has to be resolved immediately, or otherwise we could um, withhold um, IDA funds. And uh, so it's important to take this seriously. I hope we have very few instances of uh, needing to take either of those steps, uh, just because you know we all know that you know the the we're we're asking for information to make these LEA assignments. If you have updates after we've made them, we can certainly take them into consideration. But once they're made, uh, we do ask that you act with all due haste to make sure that they are implemented. And again, as I always say, we'll be glad to take any questions you have about this. We hope you'll spend a little bit of time looking at the advisory 
uh, just because it's new and updated. And um, again, I, I don't think that it, it doesn't kind of radically change the practices that we're all used to. I think it just clarifies this process in particular about what happens if um, the assignments aren't, uh, aren't acted upon. So um, another thing that is in the works um, to, to look forward to in June is the, um, the special education program plan statements. So the SEPs, as they're often called. Uh, keep in mind that the SEPs need to be updated every four years at the local level. And we ask that, you know, uh, keep it on file once you update it. Um, and it really helps you just maintain the documentation named in each element of the of the SEPPs. So, uh, you know, whatever you are um, kind of assuring to us through the um, program plan statements, just make sure you keep that backup documentation along with the completed form on file. So have, um, be ready to submit the form to us once every four years, keep the form on file, keep the backup documentation. And, you know, in, in, in my experience, you know, I, I um, was certainly in special education, working in special education before and after the program plan statements came into being. Um, keep in mind that before the program plan statements came into being, remember for the um, coordinated program reviews, we had to collect all those binders and folders and lots and lots and lots of, um, you know, uh, the, the types of policies that we had in place. Um, and it was kind of an exercise for me, you know, we, it was important to do, but, you know, it felt a little bureaucratic. For me, when we switched over to the program plan statement, um, it what it did for me is it really helped me have a conversation with the superintendent, if I was the special ed director at the time, uh, with the mayor, uh, the school committee about what what we're doing in special education. And I found I found that really meaningful. I found that really powerful. And so um, we hope that what what will happen for you is that as you go to um, to, to submit your uh, your program plan statement and the signatures that you need will help you when you go to get those signatures, you're having conversations um, about the policies that you have in place and adjustments that you're making to support students with disabilities. So uh, for this June, it's just the districts that are in cohort two. And we have a link there that will just remind you who's in cohort two. If you can't, you know, you know how we have every district is assigned to a cohort. Um, so it's just the cohort two districts that will need to uh, provide their uh, updated um, program plan statements to us uh, by June 30th. So I hope you find this helpful as a little preview as to what's coming. Uh, I, I don't think it's an onerous process, but I think it's a process that does really help to hopefully kind of, you know, uh, promote conversation about special education within your locality. All right, let's move on to one of our, uh, uh, a topic we're going to spend a little bit more time on in the, these last couple of topics, which is um, the IDEA equitable, equitable services resolution. And so again, I'm, I'm following up with you on letters that many of you received, you and your superintendents received um, a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, but it's not every district. And so first of all, um, keep in mind that the resolution around equitable services relates to schools, and I'm sorry, that relates to districts that have students who are, print, who have, I'm sorry, districts that have students who are parentally placed in private schools and homeschooled students. And there are some districts in the state that have neither. And so if you are one of those districts, uh, this could be, for example, um, a regional vocational school, it could be um, a Commonwealth charter school, perhaps, um, this might not apply to you. Whereas, you know, uh, a larger district, it, it definitely applies to you because undoubtedly you have private schools in your district and you have homeschooled students. And so it's a more limited number of districts to whom this resolution applies. I'm not gonna go over the details on this slide, but it might be helpful for you afterwards just to remind yourself of where did this come from again? Um, you know, Going back to 2019, when we first got the notification uh, from OSEP that uh, this resolution uh, needed to be re re reached. And then we proposed a plan that we would calculate um, the, the shortfall instead of asking you to do it. That plan was approved by OSEP this past January, and now we need to implement. So just as a quick reminder, uh, we're talking about uh, the resolution uh, constituting $3.8 million over the next three years. And uh, so we've um, sort of divided that into thirds. And for this upcoming fiscal year, we anticipate 
allocating $1.3 million uh, towards this cause. And um, this is additional to what you already have in place for um, equitable services. So um, it's important to remember that we sent these notices and the calculations were based upon uh, the child count data provided to us this past December. So we have had some questions about why was I included? Why was I not included? Why did I get this letter? It's all about the child count that helped us to determine which districts this was relevant for. So let's just talk a little bit more about, I was mentioning before that this is additional funding. Um, it has to be used concurrently with next year's allocation for equitable services and any carryover that you have uh, from previous years. So uh, we ask that you, it, it's, um, it's gonna boost the amount of money that is that needs to be spent on private school and homeschooled students. And it needs to be spent by this upcoming, I'm not sorry, a year from this September. So we've essentially got a year plus a couple of months to spend the, the, the money. Um, and there won't be any carryover. We want to make sure that we get it and we spend it down. You know, carryover is a key component of proportionate share funds. Um, and we think it's important for typical proportionate share funds, but we don't want to add to the carryover. Um, let's spend these dollars. Let's get these services out. Um, and, you know, I know students will really benefit from them. So hopefully the ways in which we can uh, provide these services um, using these funds will be just something that we can um, get done each year of this uh, three-year process. And every year we will let you know kind of um, if your district has now become eligible for these funds, because maybe you have a homeschooled student or a private school that opens in your community. Um, so that the uh, allocation will vary and the districts included um, could vary somewhat from year to year. A private school could close, um, a private school could open. So there will be some uh, updates based on the child counts that we that you conduct each year to help inform what the allocation will be for the subsequent year. So there is one key provision that we identified in the letter that we sent to you about the number of students who you have involved. Um, so if you're a larger district, like let's just say Boston Public Schools, this does not apply to you. Um, could be a smaller district where you you have only five or fewer students who are parentally placed in private schools who have disabilities or homeschooled students with disabilities. So if you have five or fewer, there is an additional step that we ask you to take to think about, which is um, you don't have to, you, you can spend next year's allocation only, or you could take multiple years and ask to um, combine them into year one. You could say, let's take, uh, you know, if we only have one student, it's not gonna be a lot of money. And so instead of spreading that small amount of money out over three years, you could ask to take all of that money in one year, the combined amount in year one. Now, you, you, ask, you will let us know what your decision on that is based on consultation that you would do with the private schools and the parents of uh, homeschooled students. So this is this is really important, maybe one of the more important things that I'm going to tell you about today because you need to uh, work quickly on this, which is we need, um, uh, and uh, Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong here, but we need all districts to conduct consultation between now and June 15th um, in order to talk about how these funds will be spent because you're going to need to include that information in your IDA grant to us. Um, and we're gonna open up that IDA grant at the end of June, right, or early July. And we need to know, you're gonna to need to tell us based on the consultation that you have, um, how these funds will be spent. So to get your IDA funds for next year, you need to hold a consultation meeting uh, between now and June 15th to talk about these funds overall, right? These, these resolution funds. And if you are a district that has five or fewer students, you just need to layer in that additional question about whether or not you're trying to combine um, all three years worth of allocation into one year or if you're going to spread it out. Um, but Jamie, let me just pause real quick and see if I got that right about all districts needing to do this by June 15th. 
So that's correct for all dist districts that are receiving the resolution funds need to um, conduct the consultation meetings by the 15th. And any that are, have five or fewer would need to notify us by June 15th if they would like to um, elect uh, uh, to take all the funds in year one as opposed to spreading it out over the two or three years. Great, really appreciate that. Um, so again, just those districts to whom this applies, for whom this applies, and then if you are a smaller district, you were identified, this was identified to you in the letter that we sent so that you can take that extra step as well. So um, again, we kind of uh, reiterate uh, a lot of the same information about just that step that we need you to take. Um, and you will notify us via email at this email address if you are um, electing to have those funds dispersed in their entirety, entirety in your one. Um, and uh, if we don't receive your notification by June 15th, uh, we will automatically default to spreading it out. Um, so we do need to hear from you though. Um, and so, uh, because we do, you need to uh, tell, get this information through consultation in order to complete your grant. But if you don't tell us this one piece of information about whether or not you're spreading it out, we're just gonna spread it out, if that makes sense. So uh, next year we'll be engaged in uh, fiscal monitoring. Um, instead of doing monitoring after the fact, we intend to monitor during the year next year in order to make sure that, again, those, those dollars are being spent that we don't have carryover. And so we're gonna be asking you to submit information to us about um, your use of those funds uh, to show us evidence that services plans are in place and that uh, students are uh, receiving these services, that funds are being expended, um, so we'll be doing some kind of mid-year checks and then follow up based on uh, what you're able to tell us during the year next year. Um, because we, again, we really want to make sure that we spend these dollars down uh, very, very, um, you know, adequately uh, each year that this applies to. So I, I think this slide is really important. It just puts everything in one place in terms of the steps that you need to take um, between now and, uh, you know, as, uh, while this process continues to uh, to go on and we're glad to um, follow up with you about any questions that you have about this um, but I, I think right now with everything else that you've got on your plates if you could just keep that june 15th deadline um, kind of front and center um, you know not a huge lift to hold that consultation meeting have that discussion and then notify us uh, as to what the uh, what the determination will be if you are one of the districts that would be combining funds or not combining funds in year one and um, just a, a final reminder about equitable services overall, not the resolution funds, but while we're talking about equitable services, just a quick reminder for all districts that uh, are engaged in proportionate share and ID equitable services. Uh, we encourage you to start planning now for next year's grant application. Um, with everything else you had going on this year, just make sure you've got your child count information and confirm it from pa this past fall. Um, make sure that you know about, you know, kind of any um, unspent funds from this fiscal year that would then be um, brought over as in terms of carryover. Um, you know, while you're having this consultation meeting about the resolution funds, it's a fine time to also talk about equitable services overall and the funding that you'll have available for next year. And so um, just thinking about um, those consultation meetings being a great opportunity to review and talk about the child count, the estimated expenditure, the carryover, and then which services you might be providing next fiscal year. And then, you know, just really working on those, those services plans as soon as you can. So just a, a quick reminder of our overall responsibility related to equitable services, while we also focus on the resolution funds at this time as well. So I hope that's helpful. Um, we'll be glad to see if you have any questions. As always, uh, here are our resources related to equitable services. And we hope that, you know, delve in, take a look at these materials because we, again, all work towards becoming more fluent and fluid in um, the requirements. Hopefully they become more automatic um, and your team is just working to look for those key dates to set up consultation meetings uh, to make sure we get the child count done and um, you know the child find activities as well all throughout the year. So thank you for your attention on this. Thank you for your work on it. Thank you for your quick turnaround by June 15th. Um, and I will move on now to our next topic, um, which is about thinking about this summer. So, um, you know, I'm noticing that my next slide is gone. 
uh, that's, I don't know what happened. Um, so my apologies, but uh, we want to make sure that uh, we a uh, uh, theme that we're hearing quite a bit um, from schools and districts is that you're planning to offer some type of acceleration services this summer. So given the ESSER dollars, given the $70 million to enhance summer programming this year, um, we want to, I know that there are just a lot of uh, questions about um, how do you combine that with extended school year? And um, what we want you thinking about is if it's possible uh, to arrange it so that students could attend some of the acceleration uh, academy or the, the enrichment that you have going on and ESY uh, so that we don't sort of lock students with disabilities out of those acceleration services. Um, or can you uh, think creatively about combining them in some ways? Um, I've talked before about the kind of that I'm very enthusiastic that we'll have more um, general education students um, on our campuses uh, likely this summer because they will be there for the acceleration services. And so can we have more opportunities for inclusion than we've had in the past? Um, can we think about the ways in which we um, kind of, you know, uh, provide more of what students might get during the school year in the way of inclusive services this summer? So in general, two important takeaways. Um, you know, can we make sure, can we try to give students access to both um, ESY and acceleration work? I know one district was in touch with me and they were just gonna move their, um, their ESY by a week, a five week program by one week so that students could take advantage of a two week acceleration academy. Um, really appreciated that flexibility, really appreciated that thinking. Um, and, but that might not always be possible. And so even when you've got your ESY window of time and you see these acceleration services, are there ways in which you can kind of have students access more general education curriculum, access more inclusive environments as part of their ESY program um, is also, I think, hopefully a, a very useful idea, something to really continue to lean in on. Um, so um, I hope that's helpful. One other thing that I had a slide on that, that I apologize, I'm not sure what I did, um, but I want you, while we're talking about ESY, I also wanna, um, just let me look ahead to see if it just happened to move someplace else. Nope. Okay. Uh, so as we think about um, ESY, it's also a good opportunity to talk about compensatory services. So, uh, you know, when we think about ESY, we know that the um, consideration is about substantial regression. And uh, a concern or uh, a challenge that I'm hearing about is that sometimes um, teams are talking about substantial regression as the same criteria for uh, compensatory services based on what's happened during this school year. So we, you know, uh, I, I hope that we brought a lot of last year to resolution. And in some cases though, teams are needing to discuss compensatory services for this school year. I just wanna clarify that, um, you know, the, the, the need for compensatory services is an individualized decision and uh, regression or substantial regression would not be the sole um, indicator for um, or criteria to use to determine compensatory services. And what we wrote about last summer um, gives you some key questions and could continue to be useful to you. Those same questions that we asked about um, were services not provided? Um, you know, did the student not meet their IEP goals? Uh, what was there regression? Regression can certainly be a question, but it's not the only question. And so, um, and in general, it's an individualized uh, decision, as I know we are all good at, at thinking about. So just wanted to uh, call your attention back to that when we're talking about ESY and making ESY decisions, and maybe in the same meeting or soon thereafter talking about compensatory. I just wanted to make sure that we're not conflating the two and really seeing them as distinct um, and, uh, you know, making sure that we uh, are thinking about what criteria to use in either situation and uh, apologize for my little uh, issue here with my slides, but back on track now. As we wind down today's presentation with one more point to make, one more thing to consider, an important one um, and a, a theme that we've talked about before is uh, planning for next year for those students who we know and we, we can begin to see might not be able to get back into our schools um, even with uh, more students getting vaccinated, even with our staff getting vaccinated. Um, and I've talked before about the, the student who is severely immunocompromised, uh, a student who might be experiencing cancer, um, whatever it might be, uh, there are, we know there are students who we, we need to start thinking about now. 
And for this conversation today, I just want to tie us back to the regulations. I think it might be helpful to you, actually. Uh, and I'm, so I'm not going to read the next slide to you about um, home and hospital services. We're, I think we're all pretty used to this about the home hospital tutoring process. Um, and uh, I, we included for you the link right to the form so that, you know, we've updated that form pretty recently. And, you know, one of the key things about it is it does ask for a date by which the student can return to school. Um, but it does, this regulation, you know, does um, talk about coordinating services with you, the directors of special education. And, um, you know, that, that last sentence about, uh, you know, that these tutoring services shall not be considered special education unless the student has been determined eligible for such services and the services are on the student's IEP. So again, I'm only including this piece to kind of contrast it with the next regulation that I want to share with you. So this was 28033. Now let's turn to 28044. And uh, so what 28044 says, and again, this I think this fits really well with what I've been talking about in the way of contingency planning for some students. And I, I hope that actually having this regulation could help you in your planning um, to refer to it more directly is that students who you know who are likely to be out for more than 60 days um, need to have a team meeting to consider um, how you might amend a student's existing IEP or develop a new IEP suited to the student's unique circumstances. And this is all needing to be done with the opinion of a student's physician. So this is not a parent coming along and saying, I'm worried that my student might be out for more than 60 days next year. This is in the opinion of the student's physician. And we have a Q&A guide that was written you know, prior to COVID uh, when this was maybe more of a, a low simmer, um, a low simmering issue. And now it's maybe a bit more of a, a high simmer. How about that? Uh, as we you know, are getting requests and concerns. And they're, you know, I understand that they are legitimate concerns about um, some students, hopefully a, a limited number of students, uh, for whom there is concern about them re-entering school physically next year. And so, um, again, we're, we're hoping that this type of planning now, the type of coordination with um, medical staff, particularly the student's physician, can lead to the planning that needs to be in place for them to be able to get their special education services next year. And what's important to know is that this regulation is in effect. And so there's no, you're, you don't need to wait for us to tell you anything more about it. Um, you know, we think it's a good practice, obviously, to have that opinion of the physician in writing. Um, and when I brought this up in my weekly meeting uh, with Carla Gents and Paige Tobin this week, uh, when I meet with them to talk about issues uh, related to special education leaders and really appreciate their advocacy, um, you know, they pushed me and said, we think a form would be really useful. And in fact, every group I've talked to has said, a form would be useful, Russell. Yes, please provide us with a form. And so, um, uh, we are intending to look into that uh, to see how quickly we can produce it for you. Uh, but you don't need to, where the home hospital, uh, 28033 home hospital tutoring has a form, uh, 28044 doesn't yet. Um, but so right now you can work maybe through your nursing staff to get that opinion of the student's physician, um, make sure it's documented. Um, and in the meantime, we'll continue to work on um, you know, if, uh, if we can produce a form that would be useful for you, we will do so. And so that you can, you know, maybe streamline the process, maybe make the process a little more consistent by the, with the use of a form. Uh, we heard good feedback about uh, the updates that we made to the home hospital tutoring form some years ago. And so hopefully uh, what we could do for you with this would also be useful. Uh, but in the meantime, I hope that you uh, take a look at this Q&A and, um, and think about uh, hopefully that limited number of students uh, for whom this applies. So I know we've got about 15 minutes left, so let me just sort of wind down with uh, looking ahead to our next meeting, which will be June 11th at 1130, uh, probably our last one of this school year, but they won't be done. We'll keep going, keep getting you the information that you need throughout the summer as we look ahead to next year. So with that, I will uh, conclude and go to the Q&A. So Nina, I'm glad to turn it over to you to see what's on people's minds. Excellent, thank you. So we have some really good questions as always. Um, some of them we will get back to people on. The first one is a question about districts being able to identify students with dyslexia. So does the information about um, 
identifying a student with a specific learning disability mean that districts can now um, identify students with dyslexia? Yes. Uh, so we, um, you know, it depends on your staff, right? Because you need to be able to identify within the 13 disability categories, right? That's, that's your main charge. Um, and so identifying a specific learning disability and providing the right uh, services based on that is real, that, that is, that's, that's the main requirement. Um, if we have outside evaluations or, you know, in some cases districts have uh, the, you know, a neuropsychologist or someone who can, uh, you know, who does make that uh, determination, then that's acceptable as well. Not required, but acceptable. And the next question is, will the specific learning disability checklist be changed on based on this? And um, we're saying that it will be done with the IEP improvement plan. That's right, uh, especially the way in which we will, as we update the, what had been formally called the ICERS document, really looking at eligibility um, and the eligibility criteria or the eligibility categories, uh, we are updating those categories, specifically the specific learning disability category to make sure it's consistent with what's in the guidance that we just recently released. Um, so uh, yes, it will be updated through that process, which we put under the entire umbrella of the IEP improvement project. You know, what we do with the eligibility component of the IEP uh, process is what we're improving there. Great. There are some questions about resolution funds. Um, if they haven't received a letter, does it should they assume that it doesn't apply to them? Right. If you haven't received a letter, um, Jamie, I wonder, is there a place we haven't posted a list of which district? On one of the, yeah, on one of the slides, I think it's you have an email address, idea equitable services at mass.gov. So asking, yeah. sending an email to that address just to double check would be a fine thing, Jamie? Yes. Yeah, some people have already um, sent me messages. If they send it to that email address or to me, I'll um, be happy to check them. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Nina. Yes, lots of questions about homeschool students. Um, so when the students who are homeschooled and are planning to return next year, any lots of questions about how to count students. Um, especially that given that this year, many parents elected to homeschool. So do you wanna talk about the grant application, how it will talk about October 1st to December 1st will actually be the count? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Nina. Uh, so your count, just like Nina said, uh, that you will use for um, all of, you know, for proportionate share for next year for the proportionate share calculation will be based on students who are homeschooled or parentally placed in private schools as of you know the period of time between October one and December one um, of two thousand twenty, and so if they were if they were there if they were homeschooled last year um, or this this during this school year, they will count in the calculation that you will do for your IDA funds uh, for next year. Excellent. All righty. Um... This one is about, can we use unused equitable services funds over the summer? It's a great question. Yes, you absolutely can. Uh, there's nothing uh, prohibiting you from providing services during the summer. We actually mentioned this last spring. I went back and I was actually looking at the slides from last spring. Um, so we talked about this last spring of using, um, you can have services plans that go into the summer. You can provide services during the summer. Uh, I think it's advisable if you can. Um, and, you know, just um, maybe helping you think about um, how services can be provided, you know, keep in mind, and I think we'll follow up with you about this in June a little bit further. Uh, but, you know, uh, district staff can provide services, private school staff after hours can provide services, there are contracted agencies you can turn to to provide services, and collaboratives can be one of them. Um, and we can talk about this more in, again in June, but um, getting those services in place for this summer, again, through consultation, uh, you're going to help to decide when and what type of service, um, if, you know, if it's appropriate for the summer, um, but then thinking about who can provide them, um, it's maybe from within the list that I just mentioned as well. Excellent. Um, let's see, those are home hospital. If there are non-district residents in the private school, 
but we have not received an IEP, just a statement from the principal that they have a disability, should we be counting that student in our proportionate share count? Um, so, so we think it's important that you do get the documentation. Um, and Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, our guidance is that you know that that you you have the ability as the district to verify uh, that the student you know is appropriately counted because they have uh, you know a signed IEP. Correct. Great. Um, the contingency plan um, regarding home hospital is that extended to siblings? Yeah, great question. So at this time, no. Uh, keep in mind that the home hospital tutoring form um, is it's what it has in mind is the student who is you know has an illness is not able to be in school has a more limited availability for learning um, and while we understand this concern about about the siblings and we're not minimizing it in any way we just don't think that the it's not maybe appropriate to kind of attach the sibling to a standard for a student who is experiencing illness. Um, if the student, if the sibling themselves is not uh, experiencing illness. So this is on our minds here at DESE to figure out what can we do for the sibling. Um, but we don't think that uh, starting with the home hospital tutoring form is really appropriate uh, for the sibling at this time. Uh, the districts also have the ability, you know, you have the ability to um, think about this and work with families though too, so would encourage you to do so. Excellent. Do you have any new information about circuit breaker for in-district students? I'm not sure if we, if anything new came out on that. Uh, nothing new on mine, but um, how about we follow up and we'll yep. just double check with Jay. Um, and I know that, you know, they're uh, so good at doing their trainings. And so we'll just ask if there's anything new that came out there. Um, oops, sorry, one second. Um, can I'm losing? Okay. Can you combine the consultation meeting on the resolution funds with the one of the three regular consultation meetings? It's a great question. Yes, we strongly recommend that you streamline that you just make it clear. You know which which funding source you're talking about. Uh, but uh, we think that's a great idea, actually. Uh, the more we can talk about with, you know, families um, and school leaders about how we're using these funds, you know, both of them, and maybe even seeing how they fit together, you know, um, how can we kind of enhance services for students with the resolution funds, uh, but just making sure that it's clear that, you know, it's, it's two pots coming together uh, that you're talking about, making that very clear. Uh, but definitely, I like the idea of, of focusing, streamlining, and, you know, coordinating. So I, I hope that is actually what does happen. Great. What are the timelines for the implementation of the new IEP? Yeah, Jamie, do you want to talk about that? Sure. So we're hoping next year the early adopters will be... Um, giving us some feedback on the draft forms. So the timeline would not be next school year, it would be the, the year after. So we're still a ways out and we're looking for some before we finalize the forms. Great. And at what age um, should people be considering uh, dyslexia as a diagnosis? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a good question. I would ask that people take a close look at our um, the guidance that we put out um, that talks about, you know, which screening materials to use and then uh, the chapter on uh, the overlap with special education. It's hard, you know, it's an individual decision. Um, what we really want to make sure, what is so crucial is that we are screening early and, and maybe even earlier than we have in the past using the right screening tools to identify who might need an evaluation um, so that we can catch it, catch the need for dyslexia services uh, as early as we possibly can. So there's no, I don't have a, an exact age. I would say that I would like to see um, more students being identified uh, for services younger now than they have been in the past, um, trying to move away from a kind of wait to fail model um, in order to start with more of a kind of 
more just in time type of services using the um, kind of tiered systems approach that we recommend in our guidance so that we're getting the services to students as early as we can. We know that we can make such a difference at an earlier age. So like, I'm not, I don't have a target to say, you know, it's five years old, uh, but I do want to know that our five-year-olds, our six-year-olds are getting screened appropriately. That, and then we're getting those services right in place. If we identify a five-year-old or a six-year-old, seven-year-old um, with, uh, you know, uh, even just the warning signs, right? Because the screening is going to help us start to see who do we need to start intervening with right away. Um, and uh, that way we just, you know, get those services in place as early as we can. Great. Do you, um, has the department considered creating um, a school or cohort for students who have been full remote um, this year for next year, similar to TECA? Uh, we haven't. We did um, sort of promulgate information about the single district charter. I mean, sorry, the single district virtual school um, earlier this spring. The deadline for uh, letting us know if you want to open a single district charter, a uh, uh, single district virtual school has passed. So um, it's not uh, it's not an option now for for next year. But we did make you know work to get the word out. We had a good number of participants in the webinar that we held about the idea of opening a virtual school um, within your own district. Uh, and uh, we're continuing to kind of ponder, you know, kind of any other remote options. Uh, it's very actively being discussed um, right now at the department. So uh, I don't wanna kind of create false hope, but it is something that we are uh, really actively considering, maybe more on a kind of program level perhaps than a school level. Um, but again, more to come. I don't want to overpromise on that whatsoever. So we are we're working on it. Great. Uh, last couple of questions. Um, given some of the recent CDC changes in the guidelines, will DESE be adjusting some of the PPE structures that schools are required to follow currently? Yeah, it's a good question. Obviously, you know, I think we were all a little surprised when that happened yesterday. Um, encouraged, right? Like, let's. Mm -hmm. I, I'm all about the vaccine. Let's let's lean in on the vaccine. Let's get it. Let's get the kids to get it. Um, and so, uh, and you know, everything we can do is going to help us get back to, you know, uh, what we what we used to have, and maybe even making it better based on what we've learned from this experience. Uh, but you know, uh, we will take our cues from our experts in public health, from the governor, uh, and so I, I anticipate there will obviously be a response here in Massachusetts. But it's a little premature for me to talk about what it will be. I'd say, you know, kind of stay tuned next week. Um, I'm sure we'll have more information then. Great. At this point, the rest of the questions are really things that we need to follow up on. Um, so I think uh, those, that's it for today. Excellent. Well, well thank you, everyone. Day. I don't need to be the one to tell you that it's nice out. So I hope you find some time to get outside, enjoy this good, fresh New England air, and stay at it. We appreciate all that you're doing to um, really provide such needed services, such beneficial services, services for the students who we have the privilege to serve. So have a great weekend, everyone. We'll see you soon. Take good care.